Hello friends, my name is JJ, and today I thought I would just do a pretty basic video in which I answer some viewer questions about my beloved country of Canada. I use the app NGL to allow people to send me anonymous questions through Instagram in the hopes that this might inspire people to be a bit less self-conscious, and it seems to have worked. I received many hundreds of questions, and today I'm going to answer 10 that you will hopefully find interesting and informative. I will note that even though a lot of you asked for my personal opinion on this or that, I think I will be saving JJ's Canadian hot takes for a future video, because today I mostly want to focus on fact-based things. You ready? Let's get started. But. Before I begin, let us just hear a quick word from today's video sponsor, Surfshark. Hello friends, so the other day I was scrolling through my Instagram feed when I came across this charming message. In response to Canadian legislation, news won't be available soon. This is of course a reference to the Trudeau administration's notorious Bill C-18. As I explained in a whole other award-winning video, Bill C-18 is basically the Canadian government's project to take money from the social media companies and give it to the financial struggling Canadian news industry. And the government justifies this redistribution of wealth on some phony baloney pretext that the social media companies are somehow stealing from the Canadian news industry by allowing users to post links to news websites. If that doesn't make sense to you, it's fine because it doesn't. But anyway, the social media companies called the government's bluff and were like, fine, if posting links to news articles is so bad, we will not allow anybody to post links to news articles. And so here we are. Now, the only way to escape from this sort of BS, along with the looming BS that will be the implementation of Build C11, is by getting a high quality VPN like Surfshark. Surfshark allows you to mask your IP address and pretend to be from a different country when you use the internet, which is very helpful if you are a Canadian like me, but it is also helpful for a lot of other people around the world who are facing other forms of government or corporate restriction on their ability to enjoy everything that the internet has to offer. Not just news, but movies and TV shows and websites as well. Surfshark is the most affordable of the big VPN providers, and you can use it on an unlimited number of devices. And if you click on the link in the thing below, you can get three months free when you sign up for a one-year subscription. Plus, don't forget that Surfshark also has a 30-day money-back guarantee. So do not delay, stop letting the man limit what you can see online, and give Surfshark a try today. Alrighty, question number one. Please explain the 1980 and 1995 Quebec referendums. So weirdly enough, this is not a topic that I have ever explicitly talked about before on this channel. But yes, Canada's French-speaking province of Quebec did indeed twice hold referendums on leaving Canada, with these two referendums considered two of the most important moments in 20th century Canadian history. In 1976, the Quebecers elected an openly separatist government for the first time, and the guy who became prime minister of this government, René Lévesque, promised to hold a public vote on whether or not Quebec should remain part of Canada. Lévesque had only won a plurality of the popular vote, however, and Quebec public opinion was mostly pretty apprehensive about separatism, which in those days was still a pretty new and radical idea. Accordingly, the question that Levesque ultimately put to voters in 1980 was quite moderate and defensive. The government of Quebec has made public its proposal to negotiate a new agreement with the rest of Canada based on the equality of nations. This agreement would enable Quebec to acquire the exclusive power to make its laws, levy its taxes, and establish relations abroad. In other words, sovereignty and at the same time to maintain with Canada an economic association including a common currency. No change in political status resulting from these negotiations will be affected without approval by the people through another referendum. On these terms, do you give the government of Quebec the mandate to negotiate the proposed agreement between Quebec and Canada? And even with all of those assurances that this vote wasn't going to be the final word, the referendum still failed by a pretty wide margin with nearly 60% opposed. Now, the politics of the next 15 years were quite complicated, but basically during the 80s and early 90s, there were a lot of high profile negotiations between the Quebec and Canadian governments under multiple different administrations about reforming the Canadian constitution 
in ways that would be more to Quebec's liking. But they were unable to come up with mutually agreeable reforms, and this increased Quebec animosity towards the federal government quite a bit. During this same period, Quebec's non-French population also declined quite a bit throughout migration, which was in turn driven by the fact that laws emphasizing the supremacy of the French language and French culture in Quebec were becoming stricter. And the net consequence of all of this was that Quebec voters grew increasingly nationalistic during the 90s. A new separatist government was elected by a wider margin in 1994 under Monsieur Perizot. And the following year, he held a referendum asking a much simpler question. Do you agree that Quebec should become sovereign after having formally offered Canada a new economic and political partnership under the bill respecting the future of Quebec and the agreement signed on June 12, 1995? That last line was just a reference to a promise that the Perizot administration had made that his new independent Quebec government would quickly sign some sort of treaty with Canada to resolve all outstanding issues relating to trade and commerce and borders, which may be giving some of my British friends flashbacks. But anyway, in a reflection of just how much Quebec had changed since 1980, the 1995 referendum only failed by the narrowest of margins, making it this very dramatic, emotional thing for people on all sides. The night Canada held its breath and all of that. But what's interesting is despite the closeness of the 95 vote, its outcome has been more or less respected as the final word on the separatist question for close to 30 years now. And the idea of holding a third separation referendum remains quite taboo even among separatist politicians. Okay, question number two. What are some of the distinguishing features of Canadian literature? So these days I would say that Canadian literature which is to say the books and novels being churned out by Canadian writers is kind of all over the place and escapes easy characterization. During the 20th century, things were a bit different with a lot of iconic novels being written about relatively consistent themes of Canadian history, rural Canadian life, and the Canadian immigrant experience. But in this century, I think that Canadian literature has followed the broader trend of the Western world in which writers are eager to transcend narrowly predictable national themes and instead explore writing about anything and everything. When you look at the sort of Canadian fiction getting nominated for the big literary awards in recent years, you tend to see stories involving all sorts of different types of characters and settings and time periods and writing styles. A lot of award-winning Canadian novels don't even take place in Canada anymore. There was quite an acclaimed Canadian novel from a few years back that was based on a true story about American missionaries in Ecuador, for instance. I think who is doing the writing is something that tends to get more attention nowadays. With writers of color, and especially women writers of color, and people from indigenous Canadian backgrounds becoming a lot more prominent. This too, I think, mimics a broader trend in the Anglo world where readers and publishers have growing interest in hearing stories from perspectives that have not been historically heard. There is a stereotype that Canadian literature tends to be a pretty downer genre overall. You know, lots of stories about people being trapped in very bleak, miserable lives and stuff. And I suppose it is true that if you look over some of the recent award winners, stories of sexism and institutionalized racism and social prejudice do seem to be quite popular themes. But I guess that is also understandable when we consider who is doing the writing. Number three, how does a federal election get called in Canada? Well, it's not too complicated. The prime minister picks a date. The only constitutional restriction is that it cannot be more than five years after the last one. In theory, there is a law on the books saying that Canadian elections are supposed to occur on the third Monday of October every four years. But this law is also pretty constitutionally dubious and prime ministers often violate it and just pick a date more to their liking. A vote of no confidence in the Canadian Parliament can also force the Prime Minister to call a snap election, but this only happens when the Prime Minister does not control a majority of the seats in the Parliament, which is actually the situation that Prime Minister Trudeau is in right now. Which means that the date of Canada's next election is theoretically even more uncertain than usual. Number four, why does Vancouver have such a large Chinese population? Uh, I don't think that this is a particularly great mystery. If we look at the map, 
We can see that Vancouver is located relatively close to China, so it makes sense that a lot of immigrants from there would wind up here. This is the case all across the west coast of this continent, in fact, even down into Mexico and Latin and South America. Generally speaking, cities with large Chinese populations tend to correlate with being close to the Pacific Ocean. Question number five. What is the significance of the Hudson's Bay Company? Okay, so this is a pretty big topic. The Hudson's Bay Company was a British fur trading corporation founded in the year 1670. And for the next 200 years or so, it became one of the most powerful players in the colonization of North America. Even though we usually think of Canada's colonial history as being defined by British rule, in practice, it was actually the Hudson's Bay Company that controlled most of the Canadian landmass in a day-to-day -day capacity. This particular style of imperial rule, outsourcing the management of a colony to a private corporation, was a relatively common practice among Europeans in the 17th and 18th centuries, especially in British India and Dutch Indonesia. Like I said, the HBC was in the business of furs, and they employed a vast army of animal hunters, many of them French Canadian or native, with the company's forts initially centered around this area, known as Hudson's Bay. As demand for fur clothing in Europe grew, in the late 1700s, HBC fur traders moved deeper and deeper inland, setting up forts in modern-day Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. And eventually, the HBC laid claim to this whole giant mass of land, over 3 million square miles. But then, in the mid-19th century, British colonial policy shifted, and began to favor the idea of filling up North America with white settlers. Power was accordingly stripped away from the HBC, who were obviously more inclined to keep the continent a big untamed wilderness filled with wild animals and not people. In 1870, under pressure from Britain, the HBC sold the majority of its vast land holdings to the new Canadian colonial government, and thereby more or less establishing Canada's modern borders. In the ensuing decades, the HBC then became basically a multi-purpose holding company, dabbling in a bunch of different industries, including real estate, oil development, and, as most Canadians will be most familiar with today, department stores. On May 2nd, 1970, the HBC's 300th birthday, it officially became a purely Canadian company specializing in retail, with its headquarters transferred from London to Winnipeg. Now, because of all of this history, the HBC, or the Bay, as most call it today, is a very sentimentalized symbol of Canadian history, and if you visit one of their modern stores, you can buy all of these souvenirs and things. But in these more sensitive times, I think it is also increasingly conceded that a lot of that history is also very much bound up in the displacement and exploitation of the native peoples of this continent. HBC fur traders get particular blame for spreading smallpox to the Canadian prairies, where it would proceed to wipe out nearly three quarters of the Indian population. So yeah, definitely one of many historic institutions that is getting a bit of a second look. Number six. In the US, there is a huge difference between rural and urban communities. Does the same hold true for Canada? Uh, I would say yes. Rural parts of Canada tend to be whiter, more Christian, and more politically conservative, especially socially conservative in terms of things like LGBT rights or abortion. Canadian gun owners tend to be heavily concentrated in rural communities as well. Despite Canada's wilderness past, today only about 15% of the 40 million people who live in Canada are said to live in rural communities, which obviously has lessened their influence over this country's culture and politics quite a bit. And this is a problem for the Conservative Party of Canada in a similar way that it is a problem for the Republicans. You know, it's just not very politically advantageous to have your most loyal voters concentrated in such a small portion of the population. There are some rural parts of Canada that defy this trend, however, as we can see from this Canadian election map. The more northern parts of rural Canada tend to have quite high indigenous populations, and government usually makes up a 
larger portion of the economy. And these are a couple factors that tend to make these areas more politically left-leaning. Number seven, I was wondering if you could explain the cultural effect of rail transportation in Canada. In the US, there is still plenty of fascination with old trains. So I think this is a very interesting question, and there are a few ways I could answer it. As we remember from the history of the HBC, in the latter half of the 19th century, there was a big push towards filling up the empty half of this continent with white settlers. And the timing wasn't a coincidence. This dream was only possible because of the innovations in human transportation that were happening around the same time, thanks to the good old industrial revolution. Innovations like the steam engine. There is a very famous line associated with this whole project about the need to tie the northern half of North America together with a ribbon of steel. And that is indeed what wound up happening with the coast-to-coast -coast Canadian Pacific Railway officially completed in 1885. So in that sense, the railroad became an inescapable part of Canada's national narrative. It certainly often feels like basically all of the events in late 19th century Canadian history, from the creation of new provinces and cities, to the spread of the Mounties, to the various corruption scandals that engulfed Canadian politics, all revolved around the railroad in some way. Now, obviously, nobody really travels across Canada by train these days, beyond a few eccentric weirdos. So in that sense, you could say that the railroad era is pretty firmly in Canada's past. But there are still a few lingering artifacts of this era present in modern Canada. A big one being some of Canada's most iconic buildings. You see, even way back in Victorian times, there was still a lot of thought being given to making tourism an important part of the Canadian economy. Though in those days, tourism was mostly a rich person thing. As a result, they wound up building a bunch of high-end luxury hotels all along the path of the Canadian Pacific Railway in order to entice rich big shots to travel around this country. And most of these hotels remain in use to this day, including the Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City, the Chateau Lake Louise, and Banff Springs Hotel in Alberta, and of course, the Hotel Vancouver here in Vancouver. Number Number eight, what are the differences and similarities between the CBC in Canada and PBS in the USA? So personally, I think that there are a lot more differences than similarities, mostly just because I think that the CBC is a vastly more controversial and political presence in Canadian life than PBS is in the US. In theory, they are both non-profit, non-corporate TV stations, though the CBC is overwhelmingly funded by the government, while PBS has a more diverse revenue stream. Both have a somewhat similar culture of providing supposedly higher-end quality programming of a sort that might not be financially sustainable on a purely advertising-based model. Both similarly aspire to provide calmer, less sensationalistic news reporting for similar reasons. In the eyes of conservative Canada, I would say the CBC is probably one of their top three villains. <laughs> Well, I don't think that PBS would even crack the top 200 enemies of the GOP. And this is for a couple of reasons. Number one is just what I said before. The CBC receives vastly more government funding than PBS, both in terms of total dollars and as a proportion of its budget. And this grinds a lot of small government conservatives the wrong way because airing reruns of Coronation Street or whatever doesn't always seem like the best use of tax dollars. Number two is just that the CBC is seen as being overwhelmingly left-wing in its content. Right-wingers say that its news reporting is horribly biased against the Conservative Party, and the sort of sitcoms and dramas it commissions are all woke nonsense. You can certainly take or leave that opinion, but it is a very mainstream conservative belief. And number three is just that the Canadian media market is much smaller than in the US, with fewer channels, and especially fewer news outlets. And this means that the CBC just looms a lot larger in Canadian life as a cultural force than PBS does in America, where it is a relatively small player in a pretty crowded media scene. One other minor difference would be that the CBC also has a radio arm as well, while in the US, the equivalent of CBC Radio, NPR, 
is completely separate from PBS. Question number nine. Are Canada's provinces split into counties or county equivalents like the United States, or do they have a different system of local government? All right, another Canada-US question. Yes, I believe that every province does have some additional level of government between the provincial and municipal layers that helps coordinate public services within a multi-city geographic zone. I honestly don't know a lot about how county governments work in the US. I get the impression that it is relatively standardized from state to state. In Canada, however, it seems to vary a lot from province to province. Here in British Columbia, for example, we call the middle tier of government the district government, with the politicians who run the district government appointed by the city councils of the cities within that district. In Ontario, they have what they call regional governments, with a regional council that is directly elected by voters who live in the constituent cities. In Quebec, they have MRCs, which are run by a council of mayors under the supervision of a provincial cabinet minister. In my experience, most Canadians are not terribly aware of this level of government. I'm sure that's true of much of America as well. But I am under the impression that in some states, being a county commissioner or county president is seen as a relatively high profile, powerful job that can be a springboard to some higher office at the state level. And that is very much not the case in Canada. And lastly, question number 10. What is the general nonpartisan consensus about Justin Trudeau? Are many Canadians satisfied with his leadership or are they looking for a change? So I think that the fairest, most nonpartisan analysis I can offer is that Justin Trudeau was legitimately quite popular when he was first elected in 2015 and enjoyed a pretty long honeymoon with the public, especially after the international media started boosting his profile. In both style and policy, he offered a pretty dramatic break with the conservative government that had come before him, which had grown very unpopular near the end. I think that Trudeau also frankly benefited quite a bit from being such a visible contrast with Donald Trump, who was also quite unpopular in Canada. Trudeau's numbers have been in a pretty steady downward fall since 2021, however. And according to Angus Reid, he hasn't once cracked 50% approval in the last two and a half years. The polls currently suggest that he is not favored to win a fourth term. Although it could be a while until the next election comes, as we learned earlier. Obviously, if you are a more conservative person, this will all seem very logical, because conservatives in this country tend to believe that he has been the worst Canadian prime minister and all of that. The more moderate take would just posit that all prime ministers have a bit of a shelf life. And once you start getting close to a decade in power, all of the bad press and controversies and mistakes that a politician will inevitably rack up, start to hit a bit of a critical mass. And that is basically where Justin Trudeau is now, just like Prime Minister Harper was before him. I would just add that it is worth remembering that Trudeau did not win his second and third terms by particularly large margins. And I think to a significant degree, his repeated re-elections have been as much about public wariness for the guys running against him as any great love for the Prime Minister himself. Alrighty, 10 questions about Canada in the can. I hope you feel like you learned something. If you have any insights or thoughts on these topics that you want to share, let me know in the comments below. Do not forget to check out Surfshark, and I will see you next week.